So, with all of the talk about the bedchamber, I think that we all understood by now that its principal item of furniture was not designed solely for sleep and repose. Um, I have never had the temerity to ask my parents if I was, but most of us were conceived in a bed. We also first experienced the light of this world from one. Wedding nights are normally celebrated in a bed, though not always privately, as testified by this image here. When sick, we are confined to a bed, and sadly, our last breath will probably have been drawn in one. These principal moments in our lives have always been celebrated as important rites of passage with accompanying rituals. So when sick, we are confined to bed, and sadly, our last breath will probably be drawn in one. These principal moments in our lives have always been celebrated as important rites of passage with accompanying rituals and festivities that require food and drink, in some cases actually consumed in the bed or by the bedside. Festive food and drink associated with births, christenings, betrothals, weddings and funeral rites usually had a distinctive character. Of course, it varied from country to country. In 18th century France, a betrothal was usually celebrated with specially made wafers emblazoned with the date and the initials of the bride-to-be on one side and those of her groom on the other. In 17th century Scotland, where betrothals were known as contracts, engagements were celebrated with what were called contract pies. In 17th century Scotland, where betrothals were known as contracts, engagements were celebrated with contract pies, a complicated pastry topped with a mother hen surrounded by a generous number of chicks, obviously designed to raise a chuckle among the guests. At the wedding feast itself, a so-called bride pie was often served with a glass wedding ring hidden among the filling. Whoever plucked this prize out of the crust would sure to be wed before the year was out. A brushing Caledonian bride might also be subjected to the following ritual. This is a description of one. The bridal party, after leaving the church, repaired to a neighboring inn where a thin current cake marked in squares, though not entirely cut through, is ready against the bride's arrival. Over her head is spread a clean linen napkin and the bridegroom, standing behind the bride, breaks the cake over her head, which is then thrown over her and scrambled for by the attendants. You might sort of think about the tradition of throwing confetti when you hear that. In some parts of Northern England, guests were frequently invited to a funeral with a biscuit wrapped in crepe paper, suitably printed with a solemn verse. Your edible invitation was usually delivered to your house in a basket by a young woman. In Yorkshire, these biscuits were sometimes formed in a wooden or stone mould carved with a stylized heart, like this example. I don't know if you can see, but this is actually a, a mould to print a, a funeral biscuit. There's one 17th century one, which is in the um, Yorkshire Museum, which is made of stone, which dates from the mid-17th century. This one is probably early 19th century, so there's a lot of continuity in this. These biscuits always, always contain caraway seeds, which I'll come to a little bit later. However, betrothals and funerals aside, I will concentrate chiefly in this talk on food traditions related to births and weddings, and some of the material culture that crystallized around these events. An astonishing range of objects used to make celebratory food has survived, but customs change, and much of the material culture of ritual foods of this kind is poorly understood. For instance, this delightful boxwood mould, which is really tiny, it's about that long by that wide, allowed a confectioner in the early 18th century 
to actually make a test of bed out of sugar. And you see, if you look at it, you can see um, there's some charming molds here for the pillows. And if you look at the bed head, there's actually an erotic scene carved into the boxwood there. Um, and there's a sort of, it's Cupid actually, you can just see his quiver at the back hanging around on the top of the bed. Now, the collection that has this about 20 years ago gave me about 10 minutes and allowed me to actually use it to, um, to make um, the bed. So, there you have a, you know, a wonderful matrimonial bed um, with those little pillows, they're quite charming. Um, I'm going to tell you, it's almost certainly Netherlandish, it's probably Dutch, and in, in Holland they had a tradition of using little caraway seeds that have been coated with sugar. I don't speak Dutch, and if anyone does here they can correct me, but I think they were called mushes, which means mice? Mushes, mushes, yeah, which means mice. Now, the theory is that the little end of the caraway seed is often visible, like a little tail. But that's just a load of nonsense. After 300 years of Calvinism, they got, you know, rather ashamed of the original thing. It was actually because they looked like mouse droppings. But they're technicolor mouse droppings, if you like. Um, however, was it for the top of a bride cake or possibly a wedding march pane? Unfortunately, no user manual survives, so we'll never know. Thinking of Meredith, really, I, I could just see a little Lilliputian Casanova jumping into it and going about his mischief. <laughs> in contrast, the remarkable trays which were used for presenting sweetmeats and small gifts to celebrate the arrival of a baby in Renaissance Tuscany are really well studied. This is not surprising since these Desco di Parto or confinement trays are astonishing and important works of art compared to utilitarian culinary equipment like this object. This one, um, painted by Bartolomeo Froesino in 1405, shows the mother in the confinement bed with, surrounded by her um, womenly friends with attendants on the left who are male coming through the door there. Um, bringing in gifts. Now, I want you to look as carefully as you can at that opening, um, and you can see there is an attendant here, and in his hand, he's got a strange-looking object. It looks a bit like a drum with some funny fringes on it. But, um, and here, there is a young man carrying what could actually be one of these trays, which might be covered with little gifts. They weren't just used for food, but also for any little gifts. And you can see that some of the mother's friends are actually um, helping her wash her, her hands, um, and others are bringing food to her. And there was a whole range of wonderful neonica that was actually designed for serving food to the mother in bed. But I want to concentrate really on what's going on in that little archway on uh, the left. Now this, the most celebrated of all these confinement trays, uh, which is known as the Berlin Tondo, illustrates a similar birthing scene with attendants carrying in gifts, again on the left. The Brunelleschian um, structure, anyone who is before the columns on the left-hand side is in the male world, and the separation of the world of the women who are attending and visiting her. So with all the pomp of carrying the fleur-de-lis flag of the city of Florence, um, they are not going to be allowed in there. They're just going to pass these gifts over so they can be given to, given to the mother. Um, so this one is really celebrated because it's allegedly by one of Masaccio's followers. It's now known that it was probably painted by his brother, which is, is really quite interesting. So again, um, it's very early. Um, but what interests me, really, as a little aside, is its actual, um, the way it's been framed, with this very early use of a, a laurel wreath, a tondo. Um, because 
The tondo frame of this tray with its wreath of laurel leaves was also used throughout Europe as a feature of figurative celebratory dessert food such as these marzipan edible bas reliefs. These two 16th century molds are typical of the German-speaking world. That on the right, which shows the marriage feast of Cana, may have been served at a wedding feast. French, Iberian, Italian, and English molds in this form have also survived, and there are many, many of them. And they usually have the laurel wreath, you know, tondo form around them. Um, in fact, there's a residual version of that, even on this little wooden biscuit print. Um, it becomes a, an ubiquitous theme of these things. And there are designs for these, and although these were published in the um, early 18th century, um, they're the work of um, a cook called Conrad Hager, who worked for the Prince Archbishop of Salzburg, and were probably made for some major ecclesiastical festivities, um, possibly in the residence or even in the Schloss Hilbrun. Um, so you can see again, you've got this tondo form to these things. And they were usually made from almond paste, although there were other types of edible food that was molded in them. And they turn up basically as being celebration foods, often at birthings, christenings, and, and weddings. So <clears throat> this early ne Netherlands example of one of these marzipan discs where you've got a rather token kind of tondo frame, which has just been made by the chef crimping it like a tart or a pie. Um, this is in a painting by the wonderful Antwerp artist Clara Peters. Um, most recipes instruct the cook to put this marzipan disc on a layer of flat wafers, which actually can very clearly be seen here. Can you see there's a little white row, and what they've done is, is to stop it sticking to the oven bottom. So they would, and that's there, so that follows the, um, the recipe. Um, her multipan is covered in a knot design made of carefully arranging caraway comforts, the, the mice I talked about earlier on, these little um, caraway seeds. Um, now, you may have noticed um, also, some of those on my bed, you know. Um, so that's why I put them there, because they were used to decorate often celebrated food, particularly in Holland at a birthing, even now, I think you have little uh, biscuits with them on. Um, and, but it, they were also used at wedding feasts, too. Um, and this is almost certainly um, a kind of wedding banquet, if you like. Um, the rosemary plume in the um, march pane is hung with what were called muscadines, which are gilded. In England, these were known as kissing comforts because they were perfumed with powerful musk perfume used to sweeten lovers' breath before they kissed. The rosemary is emblematic in both the Low Countries and England. Most people associate rosemary with funerals because of Shakespeare talking about rosemary. That's for remembrance. But extraordinary, at very early English weddings, um, A, the grooms, who like the boys who escorted the bride, used to have rosemary tied to their elbows. And there was a, a way of bringing um, a cake into the feasting place from the bride's house and wine from the groom's house. It was nothing to do, it was based on the marriage feast of Cana, this early kind of service. So in the wine, they used to put rosemary branches and tie knots of ribbons around them and usually have the, the stemma, you know, the um, coats of arms of the two families. There's a brilliant example, which I'm not showing, it's two actually at, at, um, at Hatfield House. Um, there's two paintings by Marcus Gearhart, which actually show an English wedding procession from the 1580s. And if you look very carefully, you can see these plumes of rosemary in this golden cup, um, which is being paraded through the streets of London. So rosemary was very much associated um, with these wedding um, celebrations. Also, a number of foods with alleged aphrodisiacal properties, thinking of um, dear Meredith again, such as Casanova's oysters, 
and a box of quince paste indicate this is almost certainly a banquet for a wedding. Um, quince paste was thought to be a good for digestion, but also it was what they called a restorative, which meant it was a it was it, it, you know it basically induced venery as they called it at the time, um, and. Um, it, this was very commonly known, so much so that in London in the 16th century, a prostitute was known as a marmalade madam. And the reason for that is quinces in Portuguese were marmelo, and at this time, marmalade was made from quinces, not oranges. Um, and there were even jokes about marmalade lips and all this sort of thing. And it was no different, and this was actually pan-European, these, these beliefs, because they were based basically on writings by people like Pliny the Elder and Dioscorides, these classical texts. Um, so what else have we got? Um, yes, if you look very carefully, um, you can see um, that there is in the, um, the tatsa at the top, um, a true lover's knot. Um, these were known as gemelli or jamblettes. Um, and they're made by rolling out two bits of pastry and then tying them up together as a true lover's knot. Again, emblematic of two people coming together. Um, the other thing is, in the Low Countries and in England, the groom gave his bride a knife. And it was an em emblem of fidelity, like the wedding ring. And she tended to eat with it for the rest of her life. Um, and you'll notice, actually, this is well known, but. Uh, Clara's, um, the artist's um, signature is actually engraved on that knife. Um, sometimes they get, you've got a pair of them, often in sheath as well, often beaded and very beautiful. Um, but the items to which I really want to draw your attention to, though, are the wooden box filled with quince marmalade and the crinkled white sweetmeats on the small plate here on the right. Can you see these funny looking things here? Because we really need to understand um, what uh, they were for, in fact. Now, I'd like to say that decorative marzipan discs also featured at weddings in England where they were known as march pains. In 1552, Sir William Petrie of Ingotson Hall purchased 100 wrought with no small curiosity for a wedding celebration. And marzipan in England at this time was often called love or matrimony. This arrangement that you're looking at at the moment, um, I'm afraid is completely conjectural. I made it for a display at Chatsworth about 10 years ago. It's an emulation rather than a cre recreation of a Tudor banquet of march pains and sweetmeats. Um, a tone of phrase I have stolen from my darling friend Meredith. If she was here, she'd know what I meant by that. I created it really purely for fun, calculated guesswork, really. But it was a serious attempt to show the kind of confectionery that could have been served at a high-status wedding, such as that of Sir William Cavendish and Bess of Hardwick in 1547. You've seen these armorial march panes from um, Salzburg. Well, armorial march panes are often described here. And obviously, the principal family here was the, the Cavendish family. And that is very easy to do, because we know what their coat of arms looked like at the end of this, in the 16th century. Um, the other thing you'll notice there, um, on the, the um, well, in the middle, there are two little silver dishes and they contain marmalade. They often, this is basically quince paste, and we now know it really from the Spanish name Membrio, and it was printed with designs rather like those biscuits. You can see here one, if we went back to Clara Pater's image, can you see the color of the um, quince paste in that one? If I go forward to my recreation, that is what they call, it isn't white, but that's white quince, that's red quince paste. Um, and these were also presented at, at christenings and they were very important at um, lying in ceremonies. But I'm going to return to the Berlin Tondo and look at uh, the detail. 
if you look very carefully now, you can see the, the boy pulling, uh, holding the tray. It's very just difficult to see what's on there, but they look like little gilded objects, actually. Um, but the boy coming through the entrance has got um, this box, which basically seems to be trimmed um, with funny crimped paper. These boxes were made by steaming thin shavings of wood and turning them around a mould and then stapling them with little bits of, um, I think, probably bark or willow wands um, to hold them together. Um, they turn up in all sorts of um, places. Um, so, for instance, the, the best descriptive image I've ever seen of them is this one. which is a remarkable depiction of the interior of an apothecary shop. Um, some of you might know this, but if you look at uh, the very, very top of the shelf up there, if I point to it for you, can you see the boxes similar to the one in both of the, you know, the, des the, the, the actual um, confinement trays in the Italian works? But if you look very carefully, can you see these things? These are actually discs of quince paste, marmalades. This one's got an armorial printed on it. They were made all over Europe. These um, are probably almond paste that have been silvered. And I think they've been silvered on the fresco and the silver has, it looks like it's actually oxidized. Um, and it's because apothecaries doubled up as sweeter shops. Um, but what's most telling about this is on the top of the counter uh, behind this rather desperate looking man with the um, pestle and mortar, um, you can see some boxes there which are actually filled with these funny little sweeties. So can you see them up here? Um, these are long ones. And these are the same things in this painting by, by George Flagel. Um, in England, these were called band strings or long comforts. And if you hunt through paintings from Italy, Germany, Austria, everywhere across Europe, throughout the 16th and 17th century, you'll see them if you know what they look like. They were very high status luxury foods. Um, so their presence in works by Italian, Flemish, and German artists indicate that these confections were prized all over Europe. In fact, in that ravishing Sev plaque depicting a confinement scene, which Roth showed us yesterday, she pointed out a paper cone of Dragé, the French name for Italian Tragea. You may have also noticed a group of round boxes next to them, probably fresh from the confectioner's shop, and that is what they actually were. These expensive luxury items were made by coating aromatic seeds such as caraway, anise or cardamom with hundreds of coats of sugar syrup in a large pan suspended over a low charcoal fire. A thin syrup was required to create a smooth coating while a crinkled effect was achieved with a dense syrup to create the rougher pearled or ragged confetti. Among the long comforts in the oval box here are a few that have been colored red these sugary confections are much older than the fresco. They originated in India and were brought into the Mediterranean by Muslim sugar traders. By the 12th century, they were being made in Venice and Geneva. The seeds within their center contain the germ and possibility of continuing life. This is why they became strongly associated with birthings, weddings, and funerals. This is a detail of another painting by Flegel. Um, and you can actually see here um, some rather uh, smooth-looking confetti, which are obviously what we still have as, as you know, sugared almonds. That's what they are. And they're still used all over Europe um, at weddings. If you've ever been to a Greek wedding, uh, the mother and father of the bride and groom dance with them on the altar, and every, you're given a little packet of these things, and you throw them. That's why we call it confetti in English. We use the Italian name for them. Um, so, they were also, as we know, very important at christenings, weddings, uh, as well as, as birthings. Now, during the 18th century, these um, comforts, as they were called in England, 
became a rather important element of a high status dessert course. And um, this 1756 bill from uh, the London confectioner Thomas Street not only includes comforts made with barberries, cardamoms, and caraway seeds, but lists a ban or bane box. This is the English name for the traditional round or oval wooden container we've already met in the Aosta Pharmacy. A few labels for bane boxes, which contained a particular flavor of comfort or bonbon, have survived. This is rather a cheeky French example uh, for something called crotte de lapin. Uh, I'll make you work that one out yourself. Small round chocolate dragé, which resemble, well, what else, crotte de lapin. I suppose this is the French version of the old Dutch joke about the mouse droppings. Okay, now, as well as these sweet foods which were brought to um, the house of the mother and the new baby, um, in Renaissance Italy, a range of other savory foods are sometimes listed in inventories, uh, but also depicted, and a very common one is a chicken, um, which we find was served to the mother in order to build up her strength, particularly after a difficult birth. A number of early paintings of confinement show a favorite strengthening food like chicken or some other type of poultry, as in this birth of St. John the Baptist by Giusto de Menabui, which is in the National Gallery. It's on a very minor back of a panel, this, this detail. Um, but there she is. Now, this is where it gets quite interesting because some of you might recognize this wonderful English Renaissance house, which is in Lancashire, called Gawthorpe Hall. There's an incredible textile collection there. Um, but what I want to show you is an, inv an inventory, which, um, as you can see, um, is entitled, Bought of Mr. Lever, the 12th of September, 1617, a note of the spices at the time of my mistress lying in childbed. Now, yesterday, Tim talked about the a, a very elaborate void in the court, in the Henrician court, when a child was born, um, and how they stood up and they had spices served so from very beautiful um, silver gilt spice plates. Well, that word spice is, is sort of difficult to understand now because we think, how on earth did they eat cloves and nutmegs and things? You can't. What they were talking about by spices, as in this inventory, they mean the confetti that has a spice inside but is, is covered in sugar. Now, this is, a rural, this is rural Lancashire, it's not Tuscany, basically. Um, and um, it demonstrates that by 1617, the practice of serving comforts and poultry, because on that list, you might notice there is um, this word, which is a misspelling, I think, seven pouts, or poults. It means young, young chickens. Um, and there's a few other things that do really need to be explained there, actually. Um, Macaro wines, somewhere in there, yeah, um, where is it? Um, ooh, it's up there somewhere. It uh, means macaroons. And halfway down, yeah. And you'll notice March pain stuff, which I've already mentioned. Um, so that, that's, that's very, very, very interesting. But probably the most interesting thing of all is something difficult to see from here, but that one, candle spices. It's actually um, a transcription um, mistake by the Victorian reader. Um, it's not an N, it's a U. It's caudal spices, which I'll come to in a moment. Um, Little is known about the equipage used to present comforts and confectionery in an English bedchamber to the mother and her female visitors. It is sometimes assumed um, that beaded trays, like this really fine example, which is in the V&A, um, may have been used for this. Um, in Italy, they didn't put these things on the beautiful painted um, wood. They covered it with a linen cloth to protect it. It's quite likely if these things were used for that, and it's completely conjectural, really, they may have been used for babies, presents of babies' clothing or something else. Um, but there's a wonderful description in 1603 um, from a book called The Bachelor's Banquet, which paints a rather satirical picture of a christening celebration. So these things were served at christenings as well as birthings. 
And he goes on to say, what cost and trouble it will be to have all things fine against the christening day, what store of sugar, biscuits, comforts and caraways, marmalade and march pain, with all kinds of sweet suckets and superfluous banqueting stuff, with a hundred other odd and needless trifles, which at that time must fill the pockets of dainty dames. So he's referring to all the ladies, the friends of the mother, who will take these away um, in their pockets, which were little purses. Among all the comforts and caraways on the Gulf of Hall, um, there is that one item I mentioned, which is the caudal spices. A caudal was usually made from wine, enriched with egg yolks and spices. It was an important beverage for fortifying the mother during her confinement, but also offered as a soothing refreshment to her visiting female friends, a custom which survived well into the 19th century. It appears to have been a very old practice. In a 1540 work on obstetrics by a physician called Thomas Reynald, entitled The Birth of Mankind, we are told it is a common usage to give often to women in their childbed caudals of oatmeal. However, caudals were also consumed generally as a nighttime remedy for insomnia. In 1659, Pepys tells us, went to bed and got a caudal made me and sleep upon it very well. Now, I've mentioned birthings and a little bit about christenings, but I'd like to move really on to, to weddings. Brian has already uh, read a little bit from a, a poem, and I've actually got the original text of it up on the um, screen. I'll read it to you again. Um, it's a, a poem that is very amusing. It describes um, the, the actual gathering of a large number of people in a bedchamber with the bride and the groom. So, then come all the younger folks in, with ceremony throw the stocking, backward all the head, in turn, they tossed it till in sack posset they had lost it, meaning that it ended up in the posset pot. The intent of flinging thus the hose is to hit him or her on the nose. Who hits the mark or the left shoulder must married be uh, 12 months older. And Marcellus Laroon, who, who, who um, drew this in, in, six, in 1740, probably had this poem in mind when he sketched this study of such a scene a common and popular custom in England and throughout Europe. All the elements of the poem are present. A seated young man hurls a stocking over his shoulder, while a group of excited young girls reach out for it. To the right of the tester bed, a man drains the contents of an open pot containing perhaps sack posset. Many disapproved of the custom of putting the bride and groom to bed, such as the 17th century French army officer, Louis de Gaia, who wrote in 1681, all that bustle and stir that is so generally made at putting the bride and bridegroom to bed, I think is very impertinent, and I might have added it undecent too, for such a hurry of people gaping and staring and jesting and jibing upon them cannot but put them both into a disorder and confusion. And a woman must have a very great stock of assurance not to blush at so many disorderly railleries. So, caudal was served um, at birthings, along with the sweetmeats. Um, posset was uniquely British, and recipes varied, but it was usually a hot beverage prepared by prepared, making a custard and pouring it into a pot of spiced hot wine or ale. Like caudal, it was usually served in a bedchamber, especially on a cold winter's night as a comforting draught before retiring. It was often allowed to stand in a warm place and usually separated into a rich custard above and a strongly alcoholic liquid below. When skillfully made, the custard was crowned by a layer of froth known as the grace or pride of the posset. In more conservative circles, the posset was only delivered to the bride's bed after all members of the male sex had been excluded from the bedchamber. As in the 1778 poem um, by Edward Chicken, the posset made the bride is laid in great procession to her bed. The females with an edict come that all the men depart the room. Lie close and keep your husband warm, and as I live, you'll get no harm. So everyone their courses took, some watch for fear the men should look, 
and some prepare to undress the bride, while others tame the posset's pride, which was the froth on top. The bride was often persuaded to drop her wedding ring into the posset, and again, like the stocking, whoever managed to fish it out with a spoon would, of course, be the next to, um, to marry. These two unusual silver gilt vessels are often described as the earliest surviving posset cups. They belong to Archbishop Parker, who actually crowned Queen Elizabeth in the 16th century. But in his surviving entries, it doesn't, they're not actually called posset pots. I think this is a, a title that's been given them, actually, um, by a gentleman who wrote the book about them. I think he got it wrong. They're caudal cups. The reason is, you'll notice the, the cover is in the form of a little tatsa. When you invert it, it's a little stand that you can actually spoon some of the caudal out and eat it from the little, little stand. And most other um, caudal um, pots are rather like that. Um, so if I just um, check up and go to the next one. Like this, this rather nice restoration example. Again, can you see the, the stand again? You can turn it upside down and you can use it as a little serving dish. And you'll notice also um, that it's got two sets of initials on it, which probably means this was a betrothal present rather than a wedding gift, because if it was a wedding gift, you'd have three letters, the, the, the final one actually being the, the new name of the bride and, and uh, her husband. This very grand um, example um, is almost local. Um, it belongs to the Lowther family, and actually for a while stayed in this terrace with the fifth Earl of Lonsdale, who lived here. And he was very fond of it. He liked rather blingy things. And what's great about it, it has its original stand as well. And if you look at it, um, you can see that um, the, both the, the, the pot itself and its uh, cover and the stand are actually chased with um, portraits of emperors and empresses. Uh, obviously, the idea there was the... Um, dynastic ambitions of this particular family. And what's very interesting, it's engraved with the gift of Richard Lowther Esquire and Anne, his relict, which means his widow, uh, unto Sir John Lowther. So the widow must have left some money for one of these to be bought. And it's given to Sir John Lowther Knight and Baronet, who was the first Baronet Lowther, and to the heiress of that family, meaning that in perpetuity, the, the, the mother, the woman of the family would have it. So it goes down the female line and it's ceremonial. Um, it would be used or at least displayed um, during the, in the bed, female bedchamber with the, with the midwife and all of the, the ladies came to visit. Caudal and posset were, were quite similar things. Um, caudal could be savoury, um, but it was usually based on wine and egg yolks. Um, it's very it's dangerous to be too prescriptive about the purpose of these pots. These cups may have been used for serving all sorts of beverages other than cordial or even posset, sometimes even broth. As the 17th century advanced, pots used for possets, though, were continuously made with spouts, as in this rather lovely miniature one-person example by Paul Manjoy from the mid-1680s. The spout was not used to pour from a teapot, but to suck the liquid that had formed underneath the froth of the custard. Um, th there's some con controversy about this, but um, if anyone knows any more about it, I'd be grateful to hear from you. Now, this is a, a Scottish posset pot. A sil All the early ones were probably made of silver, but they went the way of many silver objects. When this went out of fashion, they got melted down. Um, this one is incredibly large, and I picked it up, and it actually without anything in it, and it must have been a real struggle. And sometimes you're told to sort of balance it on your elbow, and what you do is you don't tilt it. That that's can be disastrous, because it will all shoot over you. You just suck. Um, the froth on top was eaten with a spoon. It was known as the spoon meat. Um, so there was a degree of complexity in, in, in actually using these, these things. This, I think, is probably the earliest dated example, which is from the Pickle Herring Yard um, Pottery on the Thames um, from 1631. Um, and um, it's typical of early posset pot form. It's cylindrical in form. Um, as time goes on, um, oh, that's a stand for it as well. So like the, the caudal um, cups, they probably all had stands, rather like Turin's do. 
Um, easy to carry as well when the pot is hot. What's interesting, though, is that a lot of late 17th century ones who do have this form where it's sort of round at the bottom and straight at the top. Um, and Professor Rackham at Corpus Christi, who looked after this collection of these allegedly early posset cups, thought that the straight bit was actually um, for keeping the foam from collapsing. And he's probably right, actually. Um, I've used them in ones like this, and it does work. It stays compact. Otherwise, it starts to, all the bubbles burst, and it collapses. Of course, finally, really, um, when we get into um, the 18th century, um, you start to get very elaborate pots like this. This one has a stand, although it's probably not the original one. Um, and these things would have been impossible to use to pass around a company. So they're probably purely dead, were probably wedding gifts. And uh, the base of the stand is engraved with the initials of a married couple. Um, and so with this one too, um, you can see that the, um, the initials are actually on the pot itself, not on the stand. So I think that these probably ended up as family heirlooms and put it in a prominent place as a, a happy memory of, 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 the, of the wedding. Um, just a quick thing uh, to finish with, really, is to show you how a posset was made. This is a posset pot of mine. Um, it's not an original. I, I made this myself and decorated it um, because I've got a good big collection of them that I wouldn't dare pour hot liquid into them. Um, so I made one and um, got it to work, and it really does work. You get this amazing froth on the top. That recipe there is from the 70, 1670s, and it tells you to put it by the fire or cover the whole thing with cushions to keep the liquid warm until the froth you know, forms and the liquid subsides. So when you suck it out, you're actually just taking out the alcoholic um, beverage in, in the bottom. Now, just to really finish off, you often see these things in collections like this one, which is described in the Fitzwilliam collection, it's part of the Glacier collection, as a posset pot. But it couldn't be, because any, the glass of this period, if you poured anything hot into it, it would auto-destruct immediately. It was used for something else. Um, and the clue for that is that a recipe that was published in 1670 by Sir Ken Elm Digby, which he got from um, this rather attractive lady, the Countess of um, Middlesex. Um, and she gives a recipe where she tells you, I don't know if you can read that, but my lady Middlesex makes syllabubs for little glasses with spouts thus. And what a syllabub is, it's a cold dish, it's a frothy dish made by whipping up cream and wine, or even milking a cow into some cream. Um, and then letting it separate in a syllabub glass, which I think should be its um, official name. There's a couple that, so that's a syllabub glass. Can you see along the, the bottom there the, the separation? So it goes up that thing there, and then you eat the rest of it with a spoon. And during the 18th century, these became rare and then moribund. And you started getting these, which a syllabub glasses, where the foam is supported by the bell top of what is really a jelly glass. Um, and these become, they're depicted in quite a lot of 18th century engravings, often in confection shops. And um, really finally, I suppose, um, a related object is an invalid pot, where you, in your sick bed, you actually, again, suck if you try and pour it, you'll have a terrible mess. But those who were really infirm and tried to pour it, they were protected by this little half lid on top so it didn't slosh all over them. I think the problem there is, you know, as I'm approaching what Shakespeare called the, the last age of man, the slippered pantaloon, I wonder whether before too long I'll probably get some practical um, experience of using one of these things. And when I look out of my bedroom door, and I see the cook in the kitchen using one of these with a jar, a jar of caraway seeds. I know my um, time is over. 
So I thank you, everybody.